three months after my son Jagger was diagnosed with cerebral palsy from a brain injury at his birth, I remember sitting in the neurologist's office and thinking, what are our choices? Where do we go here? And all I was left with was early intervention therapy. Now, early intervention therapy works. We aggressively did physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy to help my child's right arm and right leg move as close to the left leg and the left arm as possible for someone with a brain injury. We also had to work really hard to get Jagger talking and fighting the sensory processing disorder and the dysregulation of his body from having a brain injury. And that's all that I was left with early intervention therapy, quitting my job, taking my child to doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment. But there was another route that I had eliminated myself from, and that was a stem cell transplant from cord blood and tissue banking. Unfortunately, when I was pregnant, I declined. I remember the OB handing me the brochure, and I remember thinking, this is expensive, and I don't know anything about it, and I threw it in the trash can. Fast forward years later, sitting in that neurology office, I wished that I could go back in time, grab that cord blood banking brochure out of the trash can and pay the $35 a month to bank my child's cord blood and tissue because you don't know how their birth is going to go. We don't know if our kids are going to end up with childhood leukemia or one of the other 85 FDA approved indications for cord blood and tissue banking for stem cell transplants. So I really wish someone had mentored me, like I'm trying to mentor each of you right now about cord blood and tissue banking. Please visit anjahealth.com, A-N-J-A health.com and learn about cord blood and tissue banking. Anja offers $100 off for Birth Story podcast listeners using code BIRTHSTORY. There's also a unique link in the show notes. Thanks for being here. Thank you for letting me educate you when no one was there to educate me. And I hope you enjoy Doula Diaries this week. Hey guys, in Doula Diaries this week, I was just going to share some of my last couple of births and some of the things that I learned. And they're just some short, fun stories. Before we get started, I have received some more Birth Story Academy love. And I just got this sweet little message from one of the participants that said, hey, Heidi, if no one has told you lately, Birth Story Academy is so good. This is my third birth and I learned something new on every module. Like, yeah, girl, thanks for writing in. I would love to have each of you in Birth Story Academy. If you have not selected your childbirth education course yet, I would love to have you go to birthstory.com and join me in Birth Story Academy. It is 20 short modules. It's self-paced. It's taught by a doula. It is qualified by an OBGYN, Dr. John Thorpe, who checks everything to make sure it's medically accurate. And it's, it's pretty awesome. I mean, honestly, it's everything that I wish was out there to prepare me for a hospital birth when I was getting ready to give birth in a hospital. There was like 1,000 resources on how to have an unmedicated home birth. And I was like, uh, I'm giving birth in a hospital and I don't understand triage and I don't understand hospital policies and procedures and advocating and the stages of labor and what my choices are for medical intervention. So I made that course and I recorded it in a hotel room in Arizona. So it's kind of got an amazing backdrop. Anyway, I'd love to have you guys in Birth Story Academy and you can go to birthstory.com to enroll. Let me tell you about my last couple of births. Oh my gosh, this one I'm going to start with is just like, It's literally mind-blowing because I learned something new on every single birth, but this was like, thank you, midwife kind of story, okay? So my client went to 41 and 4, of course. She's a first-time birthing person. The average gestation is 41 weeks in one day. Like, if you think you're giving birth at 39 weeks, like, I'm going to kiss you and give you a hug, but like... The average is 41 and 1. So like 50% of you are going to give birth after 
41 weeks in one day after. So, so lie to everyone in your life. Lie to everyone in your life and tell them that, you know, if you're due on July 1st, you're due on July 14th, okay? That's my best advice I can give you. So she's at 41 and 4, and she started having contractions in the evening and was like, oh, you know, I think this is a little different than Braxton Hicks. Do you think she called her doula? No. I think she she says now she was like kind of afraid it was going to be like, you know, false labor or something. But she was kind of hanging out with her family and doing their thing. And um, she thought maybe she was in labor. And so she went home and maybe around nine o'clock crawled into bed. But she set her alarm for midnight because it was the night of the super pink blood moon, powerful moon. And she thought, okay, if I set my alarm for midnight and I walk out and I look at the moon and I put my bare feet into the earth and I ground myself, then maybe I can like just draw on that moon energy and have a baby. And that is exactly what she did. So she slept a little, which is the first thing we recommend as a doula is when you think you're in labor, go straight to bed, be horizontal as long as possible until you cannot be horizontal anymore. Then data shows that being upright helps reduce your length of labor. But until you cannot be, until you have to be vertical, be horizontal. So she goes to sleep, she rests, she keeps up that energy, she sets her alarm for midnight, and she goes and draws in all this moon energy in about, let's see. So let's say like the first signs were about six o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon. Then um, I'm just going to give you the timeline. She gave birth at 4 p.m. the next day, so almost 24 hours. So really your typical, you know, 41 weeks, four days, almost 24 hours of labor. And um, she called about like three or four in the morning and she called my work partner, Colin, who does the night shift. And Colin went over to her house. You know, they kind of labored in the tub and, and all of that kind of thing. Her water broke spontaneous rupture of membranes, so SROM, around, oh yeah, around 1.30 a.m. So so the way I'm telling the story is that she's kind of at a cookout and she's with her family and she's like, I think I'm in labor. She goes home. She goes to sleep. She wakes up with the moon. She tries to go back to sleep. Her water breaks. By 3 a.m., she was like, oh, okay, this is definitely labor. That moon thing worked. She calls Colin. Colin gets over to her. And at three o'clock in the morning, her contractions are three minutes apart. She's having blood tinged mucus. She's really having to stop and breathe through them. She tries to lay down and rest, but when she's laying down, they're just more intense. And in about five in the morning, her partner's like, maybe we should go to the hospital. And Colin being the great doula that she is, is like, hold the phone. Your wife didn't want to go to the hospital until she was much further along in her labor. And so um, we kind of all agreed to stay home. So now I came on shift at eight o'clock in the morning. And when I got to their home, thankfully we were still home. She was having lots of back labor and back pain. So we were positioning her to help her baby rotate from an OP position to an OA position. So when you're having all that back labor, it typically means that the baby is not quite rotated to head down, face down. Sometimes the baby is facing sideways or facing towards your belly button, and that can cause more back pain. So as trained doulas, we have very specific ways in which we move your body, push on your sacrum and your hips, rotate you in different positions to help a baby rotate and give abundant room in the pelvis. That is why when you hire a doula, cesarean sections are lower and length of labor is lower is because we are trained on how to move your body. So we were really moving her body and doing tons of inversions and hip squeezes and lunges to give abundant room for this sweet baby, Team Green. So we didn't know the assigned sex of this baby. So at this point, about 8 o'clock in the morning, she's having lots of burping, lots of belching, which is another sign of labor progression. 
I was looking for McAllister rumbus, a bulge on the backside of her sacrum and a little purple line on the back of her rectum to show dilation. I really wasn't seeing too much of that at eight o'clock in the morning. So we just did some more positioning, hands and knees in the bathtub, laboring on the toilet. Now on the toilet, this is where everything always changes, you guys. Her water was broken, so more and more water was kind of like leaking out on the toilet. And um, about 9.30 then, we all made the decision to go to the hospital because she was starting to get a little grunty and I was starting to see that bulge in her back. So we transitioned to the hospital. She got into triage. Her birth plan said a home birth-like environment at the hospital. So that meant like no IV port, no vaginal exams, like it was just like, you can take my blood pressure, but like, I'm just kind of here in case I'm bleeding to death. Essentially, this was this mom's plan was just be in the hospital if there was an emergency, but otherwise like, leave me alone. Let me be in my primal state. And guess what? All of her midwives were like her biggest cheerleaders in that. They're like, of course, no IV port, no vaginal exams, free movement, limited monitoring, eat as much as you want, drink as much as you want. It was it was so beautiful. It really was. So we get to the hospital about 11 o'clock. She's starting to push against the pressure. She's having lots and lots of pressure. But that baby was OP still. It was all back labor. So we did more sideline releases. We did this cool move called Flying Cowgirl. We did the jiggle. I mean, we did all of our best tools on spinning babies to help that baby rotate around. And eventually I was like, you know what? Let's get that aquadural going since you want an unmedicated birth. And so we got her back in the bathtub with the jets, the like whirlpool jets. And in there she kind of was in and out of sleep and she was deeply, deeply relaxed, not fighting the surges so that her pelvis could open. And at at noon, she opens her eyes and she looks at me while she has her sunglasses on. And she looks at me and her spouse and she says, I am going to need an epidural. And I said to her, because we know each other very well at this point, I said, no way. I said, you, I'm happy to give you an epidural after a vaginal exam. I believe that you have just gone through a transition, that you are asking for an epidural because you are, you are about to deliver your baby, that you're that close. I have been laboring with you. I, I know you. I know your body. I've felt your body. I've been watching your baby move from OP to OA. Like, Let's do a vaginal exam and just make sure you aren't ready to push your baby out. And if you aren't, let's say if you're four centimeters dilated, which I knew she wasn't, then of course, let's talk about getting an epidural. So she was like, okay, Heidi, let's thank you for negotiating that with me. And she got out and the midwife was like, "Mm, no cervix plus two station. (laughs) It was noon. And so she started, she was laying there until she gave a couple of pushes on her side. We pushed for about an hour and she was getting really tired, you guys. And so I said, why don't you sleep and labor down? People think laboring down is for an epidural. No, laboring down is like not pushing when you're complete. Her fetal ejection reflex just wasn't quite triggered. And so at some point I was like, are you pushing because your body is forcing you to push? Are you pushing because like you're 10 centimeters and we're all kind of standing around you like push. And she kind of said that she didn't really feel like that urge to to push. She was just pushing because she thought that it felt good to push, but it wasn't really a reflex. And I was like, you know what? I know it's really hard and I know you're really tired, but I need you to get out of the bed. I told her that. I'm like, I'm your doula. This is what you paid me for. I'm going to need you to get out of the bed. I'm going to need you to put your feet on the floor. This is the girl who had to put her bare feet on the ground and channel the moon. She needed to be grounded to this earth. She needed her feet on the floor. And I'm like, let's go to the toilet. Your baby needs to rotate. So we're going to do, we're going to sit on the toilet, but with like our right leg up. And then we're going to sit on our toilet with the left leg up. 
and we're going to kind of labor down on the toilet. So she labored down on the toilet for like about an hour until she really started to feel that reflex. We were feeding her like electrolyte drinks. Her spouse had done um, frozen blueberries on her wrists to keep her cool. We had lavender ice cloths on her forehead. She was having this really wonderful unmedicated birth experience. And again, two now two hours earlier, she was 10 centimeters plus two. And um, the baby hadn't really moved much. And so um, sitting on the toilet and getting her feet on the ground, that kind of gave her that power. Now, one of my other doula partners came in who had been with us, Sabrina. And Sabrina said, why don't we coach push? Hold your breath. Now, that's something we typically don't recommend because it can cause often trauma to the vagina and to the pelvic floor. But every now and then, coached pushing is what a birthing person needs who's very tired. So I said, okay, let's do it. So we had her take a deep breath in while she was on the toilet, hold her breath. And while we counted to 10, which we do very rarely, she pushed down to the ground, to the floor while we counted. And that turns out is exactly what she needed. She needed after trying for two hours to kind of do it on her own and body led, she just needed a little bit of coaching. And that is really what helped her. And like within a few pushes, we were like, oh my gosh, okay. Like the baby is coming, you know, (laughs) essentially. And the midwife and the nurse were like in the room. So the doulas and um, the birthing person and the partner were just all in the bathroom together. We were just all hanging out. I had a flashlight out and the midwife was like, you know, just kind of let me know. And the midwife was actually like, I can catch a baby anywhere, but like, you know, let me know. So when the head was like pretty much crowning, we were like, okay, now just breathe. And um, the midwife set up the bed in like the coolest position I've ever seen you guys. She took out the bottom of the bed and put the stirrups like down to be like pedals and then put the squat bar over it. So I'm ho- I'm hoping you can vision this with me and maybe the birthing person will let me share on my Instagram at birth.story.academy. Go check there and see if there's a picture of it when this episode comes out. But basically hanging in the air. She's like hanging on the squat bar, but her legs are like in these stirrups, but like there's nothing below her, right? Like there's no bed below her. So her husband rips his shirt off because he's ready to catch the baby and he gets under her and the midwife is guiding and she has maybe two or three pushes there until the head emerges and her husband catches the baby and then lifts the baby up to her chest and it was just like so cool you guys because that is a hospital birth that is what body autonomy, birth preferences, working with a midwife, like that, that's what that looks like in a hospital setting. No IV port. She was eating and drinking. She maybe got monitored twice. She only had the one vaginal exam. And that's when we were decision making. Do we get an epidural or are we in the middle of transition and that's why we're begging for an epidural? It was a decision-making vaginal exam. So just one vaginal exam. Like it is so possible to have a home birth-like experience or a birth center-like experience at a hospital if that's what you want. But you know what? Please take Birth Story Academy. Like The things that are possible are because she had the right birth team. First of all, she was in the right practice. She had the right midwife. Her partner was educated through Birth Story Academy. She had the right doulas. And we were able to work as a team and offer different suggestions and movements. And we moved that baby OP to OA. Her husband got it to rip his shirt off and catch the baby. Like we can't get more primal than that in a hospital. It was amazing. And so I want to encourage you by sharing this birth story in Doula Diaries. I was going to do multiple stories today, but that one took 18 minutes. So we'll just cut it off with this one. 
But like, I want to encourage you that this is possible. It is possible that a hospital policy and procedure is not law, okay? It's not freaking Roe v. Wade being overturned by the Supreme Court. Like, it is, you know, what their preference is, but no one can do anything to your body or touch your body without your explicit consent and permission. You do not have to get out of the bathtub. You do not have to get off of the toilet. You do not have to get, you can do whatever you want in your birthing time at a hospital as long as you know what you want, you're listening to your body, and you have the right team. You have a midwife or an OB that is on your side, that believes in your body's ability to give birth And is also there to keep you safe, right? At any point in this birth story, the midwife would have absolutely intervened if she felt like the mom or the birthing person and the baby were at risk at at any point, right? But this was a very uncomplicated 41-week, four-day gestation, nine-and-a-half-pound baby, 22 inches long, And at birth, we did find out his assigned sex was male. So it was such a beautiful birth. I want it to be inspiring to you. And if you're like, that's what I want, and I have no idea where to even start, DM me, get on birthstory.com and enroll in Birth Story Academy. Like, I want to teach you how to make this type of birth story your reality. That's why I do what I do. Okay, I hope you guys have a great week. And this was me telling my experience of this birth story. And on Thursday, we'll have a birth story for you to listen to. Just a reminder, you can go to Anja Health at AnjaHealth.com, A-N-J-A Health. .com, and there you will find a beautiful experience for parents. It's modern. It's warm. The CEO has a personal story with a child with cerebral palsy also. So the community at Anja Health is very family-like. It's all about honoring Catherine's brother. And the science is there. The science is the future. Consider using Anja Health for your cord blood banking by using code birthstory when you check out. And I've also left a unique link for you in the show notes.